by way of introduction, just a preface as we, we dive into this next section. Um, I, I want us to think a little bit about um, why we're doing this. Why, do we, why are we giving our time to think through these things? Why do we just spend uh, 45 minutes thinking about the Jesus model um, and the Great Commission and how that should frame up and shape youth ministry? And I think a, a really important thing to arrive at is the, the sense where it helps us to establish a really good and healthy biblical philosophy of ministry. And as I think about that, I think about it really in this context, is it's asking the why questions. Why do we do what we do? And I think those are the most important questions that we should be asking. Those are the questions that leaders need to ask. Why do we do what we do? Because those questions uh, help us to identify the principles that ultimately should shape our, our ministries. What are the principles? What are the values? What are the things that are going to underpin and, and shape our ministries? Um, what questions are really questions about the programs? What do we do? What do we do that helps us to achieve why we exist? Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? Um, and the high questions, certainly as it, as, as it pertains to youth ministry, are, are really, that's where we might think about the curriculum and, and the things that we teach. Apologies for my writing. Okay? Um, but I would suggest to you that most of the time when it comes to youth ministry, uh, people are consumed by the what and the how. What are we doing? How do we do it? Um, I think we need to spend a little bit more time on the why. Why do we do it? Why do we do what we do? What's our purpose? And that is going to have an ultimate effect and a shape on, on what we do and how we do it. Tracking? Make sense? Yeah? So, um, as I think about youth ministry, uh, this is the purpose statement that, that I have used for, for many, many years now in youth ministry. Um, and I believe it's, it's rooted, it encapsulates that sense of, of, of the Great Commission that we're talking about. The, the, the intentional influencing of young people to be or to become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. The intentional influencing of young people to be or to become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And there are words that are um, in this purpose statement that are very intentionally uh, placed there. <laughs> One of those is the word intentional to begin with. Um, the intentional influencing. And I, and, and I think of that not in terms of manipulating young people, but rather strategically and deliberately targeting them. Okay? Um, this is what Paul, certainly in Colossians 1, 28, 29, um, was doing. He was intentional as he sought to influence those Colossian believers that he might produce them, that he might uh, produce them mature in Christ. We want to see our young people become mature in Christ. We want to see them grow towards maturity. We want to see them survive, but not just survive. Uh, we don't want to see them exit their faith when they exit the high school ministry, the, the teenage ministry. We want to see them thrive as followers of Jesus. Uh, building into their lives so that in the future, um, their lives uh, can have that richness of, of growth, maturity, and fruit. Um, that they might be or become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. So, summing up what we were thinking about from that last session. Uh, our mission is clear. Uh, what Jesus calls us to is clear. Uh, wrapped around that Matthew 28 commission is the assurance of Christ's active, manifest present, presence. Jesus says, all authority is mine at sending you, and behold, I'm with you. Look to me. Look, I'm with you to the very, very end of the age. I'm going to do it. And a third point I think is really helpful to bear in mind here is a great commission healthy ministry is not necessarily a big or a busy ministry. Right? Um, but rather it's a ministry that's focused on doing the right things.
So, we were thinking about then this process of producing a disciple. And also then the discipling environment that we can create. We see this um, in the commands that Jesus gives, the challenges that Jesus gives, rather, uh, to, to his followers. Um, come and see, repent and believe, follow me, follow me and fish for man, and go and bear fruit. And Jesus met people where they were, at their, their point of, of spiritual need. You might say their point of spiritual appetite. And he challenged them to take that next step forward spiritually. And in his life, we see those five basic types of challenges that are laid out for us. Just come and see, repent and believe, follow me, follow me and fish for man, and go and bear fruit. And then we, 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 we thought about that in terms of the things that we need to do then in youth ministry that helps us to disciple people towards maturity. Because discipleship starts here. Disciple making, rather, starts here. Um, and discipleship plays an important part in our disciple making process. Um, but we have to understand that that's, that kicks off, that begins as we seek to work with those, those young people who, who don't know Christ. So we think of it in terms of expose, evangelize, build, equip, Sand. There's kind of five, five steps um, that we can discern from these, these challenges that, that Jesus gives. And one of the things I said just before we finished was last time was that this this for this to happen, um, a number of things I think have to take place and understanding our role within this. Um, and one of those is, is that we need to give direction, not just instruction. Yeah. Uh, Duffy Robbins has written a great book called Youth Ministry That Makes Disciples, or Disciple Making Youth Ministry. And uh, he talks about uh, these, these various phases. He talks about direction, not just instruction, um, tools, not just talks, and memories, not just meetings. And uh, I want to mention this briefly before we kind of move on to look at some uh, ministry maps and, and some mentoring because it will help us as we think through that process. So, key to all of this is relationship. Relationships are the fuel on which youth ministry travels. It's the essential currency of, of youth work and ministry. And, and you know this. Um, relationships are, are the channel through which the grace of God flows into the lives of of young people that we are ministering to. And I think we have to really think about the importance of those relationships and also think about those relationships in, in a much wider sense. Because uh, those relationships have to go beyond the kids' table. Yes? Define the word relationship. Define relationship. Um, I would define it in, in the context of youth ministry where I, or you as a leader, would begin connect with a young person, begin a friendship, begin a relationship with that young person, but it's got an intentionality behind it. So it's not just friendship um, I think the friendship's part of it, because any friendship between an adult and a young person is a channel through which the grace of God can flow to to that young person's life. But I think with, with, with a lot, when we understand relational ministry, sometimes um, sometimes in youth work and youth ministry, uh, for want of a better term, the outcomes are, are very soft. They're very um, hard to define. What is the fruit of this relationship or what is the product of this relationship? I think we have to become a lot more explicit. Rather than just kind of implicit work and implicit relationships, we have to be a lot more explicit. We have to think through, what do I want this relationship to, to produce as I establish it with this young pe person? So that requires a lot more intentionality and being a lot more deliberate in terms of how we use our time and the kinds of questions that we ask and the activities that we do. Does that make sense? So I think it's the friendship, and the friendship's the important part of it. 
but it's taking that friendship to, to a different level where we're beginning to think, how is this relationship the tool through which I can present these challenges to this person? I want to see them move from come and see to go and bear fruit. But I've got to be strategic in how I structure it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, going beyond the kids' table, I, I, I'm sure here, like they're like at home and, and, and where I live, um, there are, are restaurants when you go to them to eat, like places like McDonald's, and they have which restaurant? <laughs> okay, um, and they have a section. They have a section for kids. And all parents think, awesome, on the eighth day, the kids section was created, right? So that's the place where you can send your kids, and they can throw their food at each other and eat the crayons, right? While you eat your meal in peace, okay? Um, this little kids section, the kids table. And I think often in church, youth ministry, kids ministry, has become a bit like that. That's that's somewhere we send the kids to. Um, it's kind of like the it's 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 a babysitting service for teenagers, you know, it's so that parents can go do real church. And I think again, as as we think about relationships, we have to become a lot more deliberate and intentional. Understand that that for young people to to grow towards maturity in Christ, they need relationships that are more than just the relationship that they have with your eyes, the youth leader. They need a constellation of relationships, a web of relationships in their lives if they are to grow towards maturity. They need the benefit of relationships with the body of Christ. Are you, are you tracking with me? Um, so that our youth ministries don't become these kind of satellite ministries that, that are not really kind of feeding in or part of of the church and you know so at some point kids graduate youth ministry and they become part of big church um, we have to rethink I think youth ministry get them away beyond the kids table and connect them with people um, and it's beautiful when that happens because um, in that process then of, of transformation as they become devoted disciples of Jesus Christ they get the benefit from the wisdom and the experience and the life of, of others um, for example, in the, in the girls' ministry at the church that, that, that I recently worked in, um, there's a lady in that church uh, named Molly. And Molly's in her 80s. But she is just this beautiful woman of God. I mean, she loves Jesus. Uh, she loves teenagers. She doesn't understand teenagers. Um, she, you know, she doesn't listen to their kind of music. Um, she doesn't understand their kind of music. Um, but she loves teens, and she loves teens coming into church. And the girls' Bible study group, the disciple group, they decided that they would ask Molly if she would come to their, their girls' discipleship group, um, where they're learning to follow me and fish, and, and have Molly teach them. And they asked her to come, and would she, would she, would she do a talk on um, her favorite woman in the Scripture? So Molly came, this 80-year-old lady, into this girls' group. And the girls that day, I mean, they'd gone the extra mile. They'd, they'd got out all the teacups and the saucers. You know those kinds of cups that you can't even get your finger through, you know? Um, and uh, the little cake stands, and they had all the little, you know, delicacy and all. Just to really make it really special. And they loved it. And they loved Molly. And Molly loved being there. And they asked her, would she come back and do a series of, you know, studies with them? And then I watched in church, the, the, these kids that would come to church. And, you know, all our teenagers would sit together in church up in the balcony um, in, uh, looking down. Pretty much because the guys figured that if they sat there, no adults could see them playing Angry Birds on their iPods. Uh, but they're sitting up there, you know, and they're there. And I watched them after the service where, we, where they didn't just bolt out to go to the, to the youth room for snacks. 
some of those girls started then to go dying to find where Molly was sitting to talk with her and connect with her. Um, and it's like they need that constellation of relationships because that's what the church is supposed to be. They benefit from the wisdom of those who don't before. And adults need that too. Molly needs that vitality and that energy and that enthusiasm and that passion she finds in these young believers. And she just gets thrilled. It does her heart good to see what God does in them and what God's doing with them. So, youth ministry happens when adults find comfortable ways of entering a teenager's world and introducing them to Christ. So, if we think about the importance and the significance of relationships, um, I think there are three levels of relationship then when it comes to this process of unbelief to maturity uh, as we seek to expose, evangelize, build, equip, and send young people. So this isn't going to be in your notes, but you can, you can write it in there if you like. I want to just spend a moment or two uh, thinking about this. These three levels of relationship that enables us to, to, to give direction and, and not just instruction. So we have the contact level. Where we might think of um, expose and uh, evangelize, where we can see young people coming in to, to making that initial contact with them. Um, the connect level, where we're kind of seeing them following Jesus um, and being equipped, beginning to be equipped. And that contribute level, where we're seeing them going to bear fruit, where we're seeing a, a deeper work done within them. So, I think it's helpful, and I want to talk through this, but another helpful way to, to see this process um, is if we can visualize it a bit like a funnel. Have you guys seen this kind of idea before as we think about youth ministry? Yes, yeah, some, of, some of you know, I, I know we'll have. Um, but if we think about our youth ministries as, as it's shaped a little bit like a funnel, sometimes this is referred to as the growth level model or the commitment level model. Um, the funnel is, if you can picture a funnel, it's my artistically drawn funnel. Um, funnel is wide enough at the top to bring people in. Um, it's narrow enough at the bottom to be intentional in producing Disciples who go and bear fruit. Okay? So, people are going to come into the funnel from the pool of humanity. So, those are those young people around us in our community who are not part of our group yet, but we want them to be exposed to Jesus. We want them to, to make connections with Him. So, maybe we go to the park with uh, a baseball. Maybe we go to the park with a football or frisbee. Maybe we go to the skateboard park with our skateboard. Um, maybe we start up a youth club uh, where we invite kids in to use the facility so they can do some sports. I mean, we, we do something which is going to connect with that pool of kids out there, a pool of humanity. We can expose them in a positive way. Um, so we would have uh, come level events for, for come and see. Come and see. Just come and be part of this. Um, and as young people come and as they meet Jesus and as they discover Jesus and as they discover that Jesus has been seeking them their whole life, um, then they want to grow. They want to know Jesus more. So they want to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And then, you know, we want to see those teens equipped for acts of service. We want to see them equipped to be able to do what Jesus calls them to do. And then ultimately, we want to see them multiply. We want to see them come out of our ministries and take responsibility, not just for their own spiritual development, but also to be willing to take responsibility for the spiritual growth of others. That they have a sense to become shepherds and leaders in this ministry. Does this make sense? So it's really taking this, this process that we see Jesus modeling for us and visualizing it as a funnel. Okay? So a model is just, is, is just a visual depiction of something which is 
maybe a little bit more abstract. Okay, and that helps me to think of it in this way. So I'm going to have those events that are come level. I'm going to have those events that are that are uh, follow me and 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 grow and develop, identify with Jesus. I'm going to have those events which are designed to help young people bear fruit. Um, that we might send them out. Okay. And as they come through this process, we're going to have relationships with them at a contact level. We're going to have relationships with them at a connect level. And we're going to have relationships with them at a contribute level. Okay. So there's obviously going to be a difference in those, those contact level relationships are going to look very, very, very different than the contribute level stuff because it's going to be so much deeper here. So there's a couple of rules with this, this kind of model. Um, The first one, as I said, um, it's wide enough at the top to bring people in, but it's intentional enough at the bottom that we're helping to achieve those goals of producing disciples who are going to look and act like Christ. Um, but another interesting aspect of this as well is that as you come down this model, the more intentional you become, the fewer people you work with. So I might have 100 young people who want to come to my come level youth club event, but I might only have you know, 10 young people that want to come to my growth level Bible study. But that's okay because what we're trying to do in our ministry is reach people at their level of spiritual commitment. But be intentional and deliberate in challenging them to the next level. Does that make sense? The idea was, um, when does, if we're, not, if we're not true and we're not um, transparent and upfront about our intentionality, then it can be perceived as manipulative. I think, it's, I think if we're honest with people, but also in a sense, you know, we're loving them for, for, the, for their sake, you know? And, yeah. and, and for that person who maybe we've spent a lot of time with, and who's maybe even come to the Bible studies, and, but they're going, I'm not, I'm not going to take that step. Um, well, then we would have just betrayed everything that we have said we believe if we just totally drop that person. Right. You know, if they go right off our radar. But rather, what we do is we, we begin to cultivate that relationship again. We begin to, to work on that relationship again and develop and follow it up. And when Mariska talks about uh, peer evan about evangelism, um, some of that will definitely feed into. I'm pretty sure what you're saying, but that's a very important point that you that you've raised with that. Um, all models are useful to a point, I would say, and then they're useless. Um, they're helpful. They're great slaves, but they're 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 lousy masters. You know, they just help us uh, picture visualize something. Let me very quickly talk about these three levels of relationship before we move on um, and look at these maps. So, uh, just to give this some context as we pour in individuals, um, because these, these things do look differently. And uh, at the contact level, we're talking about those first impression things, those first impression relationships and encounters that we have. Um, and first impressions do count. And this is where it comes to things like remembering names, remembering their names. Um, and uh, finding out little things about them, um, and that's that's tough. The older you get, because <laughs> you forget. And the other side of it too is if you've got a lot of kids, like you said earlier on, if you you know if you have a hundred people in your 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 group at your event, how can you know one hundred people? Name tags. <laughs> Um, but you, it's not possible to develop a relationship with, with 100 people. Um, but I maybe can connect with just a few in there. But if we've got a leadership team that are connecting with those, we can ensure that 
those kids are getting are getting connected with in that sense. But um, names are important. Remembering names. Um, so it's helpful if you carry like a little book, or even everyone's got everyone's got a phone now uh, that that you can write in and type in and all kinds of stuff. Just make a little note of their name. So the next time you see that person, he comes to your the next next week, and they walk through the door. You can go, Ben, dude, so good to see you. How's your week been? And what are they thinking right away? They're thinking, I haven't seen this guy. I, like I met him last week, and I haven't seen him all week, and he's remembered my name. You know? And that says something significant, because people remember your name uh, and use your name. And there's a sense of worth and value attached to that. You've all had those conversations with someone who doesn't know who you are. Right? You've met them before, but they don't know your name. And they're trying really hard to not make it obvious. You know, and you're standing there going, this person has no clue who I am. You know? But you also know what it means and what it feels like whenever you encounter someone who maybe, you know, in your eyes is someone quite significant. And they know your name. And they use it. And you're going, I feel good. Talk slow so I don't miss anything right now because I love to hear them. You know? You're going to listen. First impressions are important to you. What's the first impression they have when they walk into the, to, to your group? Uh, where does it meet? What's the environment like? Um, what kind of welcome do they receive? So um, I think I maybe said it last year to, to those of you who were on, the, on the, the foundation track. We have a group of young people and their job on a Friday night at our come level youth club event was to be the welcome team for other teenagers. And we had a little uh, slogan that we used was our job is to feel awkward so other people don't have to. You know, that first kind of con, you know, that first impression when someone walks in, they don't really know anyone, they're kind of walking in and it, there's a little bit of an awkward thing. It's a little awkward feeling. Okay. Um, so we had a group of teenagers, and their job was to be the people who would initiate the contact, and they would feel awkward so that other people wouldn't have to. Does that make sense? Right? Um, so basic and simple. And then if we think about the connect level, we're going that little bit deeper. Uh, so create intentional opportunities where you can focus on them personally. Um, find out about them, what they do with their lives, their hobbies, their, their pastimes. Notice them. Give them praise. Affirm them. I think it's so vital in that. Um, and affirm them and give them praise for who they are, not what they have. Is it in a group or one-on-one? I think one-on-one, -on -one, you know? So, and I think it's important that it's, it's individual and it's personal in that sense. So, um, I might not say, hey, so glad you're here. Man, I really like your shirt. That's an awesome shirt, right? And I could say that, and that person might want, this guy likes my dress sense. Yeah, it's good. Or I could say, hey, I'm really glad. You know what? You are a ton of fun when you're here. You know? It's, you got such a great sense of humor. And I, I just love what you bring to this group. But that's, that's something much more meaningful, isn't it? Something much more. Um, serve them as well. Listen to them. Be interested in them. Ask really good questions about things that you're genuinely interested in. And for me, I love to find out from young people things that they do that I have no idea about. Um, so there was a kid in our, in, in, who was coming to our youth club event, and he played the bagpipes. Do you know the bagpipes? The Scottish instruments? It sounds like a cat being strangled repeatedly. Right? Um, but this kid was like a world-class champion. I mean, he, he, was, he, he, he had it with the bagpipes. So I was fascinated. I was like, Scott, tell me, you know, how did you get into this? And what's it like? And, you know, do you have, you know, are you friends with your neighbors still? <laughs> you know, I wanted to know as much information as I can. So he got to teach me about something I had no idea about, um, which was fun to do that. Um, and then as you think about the contribute level, and this is where we're talking about attention with intention. And that gets to what you, were, what you brought up earlier on in terms of the purpose of relationships. Attention with intention. Um, this is what's going to require a significant investment of time um, and energy. 
And it's where real discipleship and mentoring happen. It's the fine-tuning in a relationship. And that fine-tuning takes time. That fine-tuning. I mean, they're locked into this. They're, think about it this way in a radio. They're locked into the Jesus station, right? But there's a little bit of static there. So you need, you need that fine-tuning, you know? And that takes time. And it's a one-on-one -on -one process. Um, and it's about imparting a life in many cases, in many ways. And that's, that's hard. There's no, there's no snappy formula. There's, there's no curriculum, magic curriculum you can pull off the shelf to do this. It's slow, uh, sometimes discouraging, exhilarating, uh, investing in life. Have good conversations with them. Uh, keep in touch with them. Share food. I think it's a great... I, I, for me, in my ministry, um, the most significant times in conversation with young people are always conversations that happen over food, over pizza, you know. And, um, those, are the, those are the significant times because you, there's a sense where you're, you're coming to, you know, together, to eat together and share that time together, ease this conversation. Carry out tasks together. Do stuff with them, you know? Those young people that you can gather together and say, hey, we're going to set up for worship, or we're going to set up the event tonight. And while you're doing that, you know, and, and while they're tangling all the leads up and, you know, all that stuff, you're able to invest in their life, and you're able to talk to them, and you're able to build that relationship. You're able to um, invest in them. We'll think more about that um, and pray for them. And, uh, and then share events, real life markers, exams, funerals, communion, um, life challenges. Get to know them well enough to talk about relationships and then alcohol and about sex. Those things are very significant. So there's, there's a lot more you could think about and reflect on as you think about those different levels of relationship. But if we're going to see people move through this process, then our relationships have to become more intentional. Uh, and give that attention with intention. Be nice to develop. Okay. If you, in your manuals, could like, would like to turn to, we're going to start this today. Uh, the ministry map. So it looks like this. Everybody have that? We're going to be looking at these maps um, in the remainder of our time this morning and specifically tomorrow as well. Last year we only really had one session to look at this and it just wasn't enough because this can be a really vital time as we learn from each other. Um, if you go to that ministry map, where it says ministry map. Does everyone find that? We have extra copies of these that we'll bring tomorrow, so you can take, take some with you and, and use in your, in your ministry context. But if you go to ministry map, and... And this is a way to help us think through our programs and to think through our activities and our ministries that we're doing right now um, and where they fit on this, on this process from unbelief through to maturity. What programs and activities are we doing that are, that are, that are right now specifically focused on exposing young people to Jesus? What specific evangelistic activity are we engaged in in our ministries? What build events, activities, programs are we doing right now? Okay, So it's an opportunity for you to think for a moment or two about your ministry context and, and fill in those boxes. Um, and then you can think about the people that are in these programs. Because not only can we kind of plot our programs, we can also begin to think through where are the people that we're working with. Uh, you know, where's Hansa? Is Hansa... Is Hansa come level or is Hansa, has he made a, a commitment to Jesus and he's not at a grow level? He needs that something 
a little bit more. So you could be thinking about some of those people that you're discipling, that you're ministering to. Where are they at right now? Are they, are they come and see? Are they at that point where they are, are uh, repent and believe? Do, are they ready to hear the gospel? You know? Or maybe they've heard the gospel and they've gone, no, we've got to go back to, to come and see again and begin to build into them. You know? um, does that make sense as you look at that? 